So thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, my name is John Marr. I'm a professor of music theory, world music, and digital music at Santa Ana College, and I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, David Lopez. Okay, and director, yeah, director of jazz. Uh, uh, tell me what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will be the new uh, director of instrumental studies at uh, uh, Fulton College. Okay. And? and my name is Elliot Jones. I'm the uh, choir director and voice teacher at Santa Ana College. Okay, so I uh, brought them with me, and if any of you have seen Dr. Lopez and I before, if you've seen, we've presented this panel about three other times. This is going to be new, so there's new material for you, so thank you for being here. We're going to talk about the music of Yoko Kano, uh, the genius of eccentricity and eclecticism. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Ms. Kano and uh, her, a little bit of her bio. And if you try to look up a bio of her online, it's not easy. And I think she, she makes it, she does that on purpose. I mean, you can't, it's very tough to find her, you know, birth date and whatnot. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, she was born in Sendai in the Miyagi Prefecture there on the uh, island of Honshu in Japan. She was a uh, child prodigy on piano. She entered many song contests as a young girl and won her first prize at age 10. Um, after that, and this is my biggest question, like where did, you know, where did she learn this? Um, she studied at the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique des Danses de Paris. So she spent a bit of time in France, and she does speak French. Um, she says she's not very good, but I think that may be kind of typical Japanese humility there. Um, she later uh, returned to Japan and studied music. No, I wish she studied music. She studied literature um, at Waseda University. And she didn't stay in uh, college very long. I think she left after maybe a couple weeks or perhaps a month. Um, during her time there at Waseda, she earned a reputation for being an excellent transcriber. Now, what that means is, like, when we hear music, we actually write it out. Because it's one thing to read music and sing it or play it as, as we would, and it's a different thing to listen to the music and say, okay, well, that's this note and that note and whatnot. And the fact that she can do this very quickly is very impressive. I spent a very long time teaching students how to do that, and it, it is difficult, my friends. Um, so she... Um, she got a reputation of being a very fast worker. Let's see. Her first big break was being asked to write the music for a video game called Nobu uh, Nobunaga's Ambition. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. This is from quite a while ago. And as you know, and that's why we're all here, she's mostly known for anime soundtracks. And if you talk to your mommies and daddies a long time ago, there was something called a Genesis. Not the first book of the Pentateuch or the wonderful band funded by Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins, but the Sega Genesis, which was a video game system. So I don't know. Look this up in the museums in your history books and you may find it. Okay. Um, and let's see. As she often conducts orchestras as well as her own jazz big band ensemble called Seatbelts. And if you're familiar with um, the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack, which we'll be digging into today for a bit, uh, that is the name of her group, Seatbelts, there. Uh, she is also an excellent piano soloist. And I do have a question. I did not see her either time, but did anybody see her at AX in 2010? Oh, and I heard it was amazing. It was a surprise concert. And, and she played for about an hour and a half. I think, yeah, and one, I had an audience member at uh, ALA say, oh yeah, once she came out, it was as quiet as a mouse. The whole room was just dead quiet for an hour and a half. But I've never seen her live, and I hope to meet her and hear her live someday. Um, she often records her music in different countries to bring different perspectives and authenticity to her music. So she avoids cliche, which, which makes me very, very happy. Um, when I hear her music, and you know, as uh, my colleagues will attest, it sounds like great, you know, jazz or electronica or 20th century classical or 20th century choral. She can she can tackle many different genres and she does them all in an excellent fashion, as as you all know. And she also likes to go there just to. I mean, she did spend time in New Orleans in America before she wrote the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack. She went up to Chicago to really hear the music before she you know went in to tackle it there. Um, as I mentioned, she avoids cliché. She is recorded in, shout out the city, anybody? Rio. Rio, very good, okay. Rio. Uh, good, and? <laughs> All right, uh, this next one's tough, sorry. The city, I know this, this is Poland, Warsaw, Poland, I don't recognize it either. And, and don't disappoint me, you should know this, what city is this, come on gang. <laughs> Tokyo, all right, nobody said Paris, good, that's it. <laughs> That's what I know, it's my, it's my anime expo crowd, when you say, or an anime convention, they're like, that's Tokyo! No one says Paris. <laughs> All right, her style. 
Um, as I mentioned, the seatbelts are her occasional band. From what I can tell, they have not played together for quite a while. I know that, of course, they recorded the uh, Cowboy Bebop soundtrack. Uh, they got back together briefly to do some stuff for a Cowboy Bebop video game, but from what I can tell, it was about 10 years ago. Um, and I wish they were still, um, you know, I wish they were still out there and playing. Um, it's a normal big band instrumentation, which uh, Dr. Lopez will talk about a little bit later here. Uh, incredibly diverse, excellent musicians, my friends. The repertoire includes, but not limited to, the blues, swing, jazz, you know, bebop, which you all know from Cowboy Bebop, rock, heavy metal, progressive, progressive rock. I've, I've heard stuff of hers and I can tell, okay, this is Pink Floyd. She listens to Yes, too. I mean, I could, and you can hear a lot of that in her music. And it's not cliche. I mean, it's not a bad imitation. It's really good stuff on her own terms there. Country music, uh, rhythm and blues. Funk, soul, if you all remember Mushrooms, was it Mushroom Samba from uh, Cowboy Bebop, the black exploitation uh, episode there? Electronica, hip hop, world music, West Africa, North Africa, Indian music, Brazilian music, uh, some of the cool Brazilian kind of pop jazz that uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim was so famous for. Experimental stuff. She does all of it excellent. Uh, in an excellent fashion. I would really, and I don't think it's too strong of a statement, the only 20th century composer that I could really compare her to as a composer would be Igor Stravinsky, who if, you, if you're familiar with Stravinsky, his music is all over the map and all of it is excellent. Most people know like the right of spring and whatnot, but there's a lot more to Stravinsky than, than that. But though that is amazing. And speaking of 20th century, she is also heavily influenced by some um, 20, 20th, 21st century classical art composers. That'd be somebody like me, or um, in this case, uh, Prokofiev. She quotes a lot from his Alexander Nevsky, Arvo Pert, um, which he, she's used Steve Reich. And actually, Dr. Jones pointed out she also uses is influenced quite a bit by Francis Poulenc, who we'll take a look at in a moment. Okay, the usual suspects. Uh, her vocalists, and you have heard them if you've seen any of the anime that she has composed for. Um, this is Tim Jensen. This is her English lyricist, and if you remember the beginning of Tank, which we will look at today, I'll give it three, two, one, let's jam. That's him talking there. So that's, that's the voice, and that's her lyricist there. And she gives her musicians quite a bit of leeway. If she won't spend a, you know, a day or two in the studio telling the vocalist, do it again, one more time. Okay, like on the third measure, no. Once she's hired you, she knows what you can do, and you do it your way. You bring your personality, your perspective, your, you know, your style to her music. Um, Origa, who sang the themes too, uh, goes to the shell. And I'm very sorry, Dr. Lopez and I were in Las, Las Vegas. Uh, and the day after we gave our panel, she passed on from lung cancer back in January. I'm very sorry to say she died at 42. Much too young, but... Um, she did the Cowboy, um, excuse me, she did Ghost in the Shell uh, themes also. She did the theme to Solid State Society. Um, Stephen Conti, uh, okay, uh, an American, uh, yeah, let's see, Ia, Ilaria Graziana, Italian, or also goes by Gila. Uh, Scott Matthew, an Australian, and Gabriella Robin. Does anyone know who Gabriella Robin is? Do you know who she is? This is her in a bear suit, yes. So anytime she's, because she's kind of, like I said, she kind of tries to hide like bio information on her, um, but she actually posted a photo of herself in the, in the bear suit there, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, so there she is. And here's just a quick uh, picture of the seatbelts there live with uh, Maya Mane uh, on voice there. And so just to give you a, a quick heads up uh, for some of you older otaku like me, oh, you may know from memories, uh, one of the first um, anime written by Satoshi Kon if you've not seen this, his first episode here, Magnetic Rose, is excellent. I highly recommend it. Um, Macross, if any of you remember Macross. Mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop, of course. Um, she did the theme to Rossifon. Uh, Cardcaptor Sakura, she's done, of course, Ghost in the Shell. Um, the um, Standalone Complex, uh, Aquarian, well, Genesis of Aquarian, and the sequel, Aquarian Naval. Uh, Space Dandy, I know, she, she likes everything, I know. And Terror in Resonance. Yeah, so if you, as, and these are, if you've seen these anime, they are very different sounds, all of them. And it's, it's amazing that she does as well as she does. So I'm gonna turn it over here to Dr. Lopez, and we're gonna take a look at the theme uh, to Cowboy Bebop. So go ahead there. Sure, so, you know, as John was mentioning earlier, um, you know, Yoko Kano uh, did a lot of transcription early on in her career. And transcribing music is when you listen to a, 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 a song, you listen to a track, 
and you start uh, one by one taking down the notes that you hear. And a lot of times people do this in order to get a better understanding of whatever type of music that is that they're studying. And it's the best way, although it takes a lot of time. So if you're an architect, it's one thing to you know, read the blueprints, but if you actually go into the building or the house and you start measuring each doorway and each window um, yourself to get an understanding of what it, what it is exactly, yes, it takes more time, but it's, it, it gives you a really intimate understanding of, of, of what you're looking at. And that's what musicians do a lot of times when they study music. And it's obvious to me that Yoko Kano did a lot of that transcription because she has a really strong uh, fundamental understanding of all these different types of music. And Tank is really cool. It's, um, it's bluesy and it uses big band instrumentation. Uh, it's, it's got this kind of hot style, so it's really fast, loud in your face, high energy, and there's even um, uh, opportunity for um, a saxophone player, in this case an alto saxophone player, to kind of show off their skill and their, um, their technique and with uh, the alto cadenza that we hear a little bit later. So, um, so, so you are going to get an example of this uh, hot style, like I said, this is fast tempo, in your face, really high energy, um, and you're gonna hear that with um, horns playing up in high registers um, to give that kind of high energy, so. Oh, sure, also I forgot that it does make use of um, some Latin percussion. Um, in the big band era, okay, this is uh, uh, in the 30s and 40s, we have examples of bands um, that were making use of, um, uh, so in some cases, kind of exotic percussion. In, in Dizzy Gillespie's case, he was a bebop pioneer who experimented with some um, early Latin styles and percussion. Um, so um, you, you might hear some of that in this track. Okay, and I'm happy to say, um, actually I bought, um, because when I first started, when I first asked Dr. Lopez, hey, you want to do this with me? Because, and by the way, th they're both kind of new to this. I'm, you know, I don't know as much as most of you with when it comes to animate or even the composers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I said, I said, hey, so I actually bought the four disc set and I gave it to him and I'm like, okay. Do, do what you want. So we actually it's have a cool set, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, do, yeah, do pick that. And, and by the way, friends, there's nothing magical about being a musician. Please pay for your music. Download it legally. Thank you so much. I just came back from Japan two days ago, and they still have record stores, and they still shell out twenty bucks a CD. And it's it's beautiful to see Tower Records and whatnot. So I'm happy to say, if you do buy the four CD set, if you this is not actually the TV edit, and it's not even the version from the soundtrack. We actually have a live version of the seatbelts here. So this is Tank live, um, and no, they don't use auto tune, as you probably know. Um, so I, I know, you and brother. Okay, so our sister. Um, so here we go. This is Tank live, and I'm gonna, um, as we play this, um, Dr. Lopez actually put up some cool, um, some uh, like a listening guide. So we'll listen to that. And whoa, how we go there? Thank you. 
Okay, and that was, I know, amazing stuff. <laughs> I guess I can do that live. Uh, a couple of things I forgot to mention uh, regarding the soundtrack to Cowboy Bebop. As you know, the typically the directors will start, will write the episodes and then they'll give it to the composer. And after a while, they just it was almost like playing a game of catch. Like she would start writing music, then he'd write the episode. Um, and um, Oh, oh, by the way, also, the character of Ed was not based upon Yoko Kano. If any of you have seen um, Mushroom Samba, there is a, if you buy the DVD, because I'm still old school, I like the DVD, there's actually a, a track where she has a commentary. You will learn nothing about how she writes music, but it's very interesting. Because Mushroom Samba, even though there are mushrooms, there's no samba in it. And you know, she's, she's very eccentric, but a lot of fun there. Um, and, and she said when she wrote this, she wanted to write music that she would have liked to have played as a, as a kid when she was growing up in, you know, in big bands and whatnot in high school. Okay, uh, next we're going to take a look at another tune here from um, Cowboy Bebop. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jones. And, all right, and I'm going to take this out of here just so I can not have to lean over quite so much. The, um, I'll tell you, since John has already outed me as a complete uh, neophyte to, uh, to the anime world, I'll tell you a story that you might find amusing. Uh, John gave me a CD. Uh, we had talked about what we could uh, discuss here with you all, and I said, yeah, let me stick with the vocal music since that's my area. I, I, I really, uh, my primary uh, interest and focus is choral music. So if there's any vocal or choral music, let, let, get, give me some recordings of that, and, and I'll listen to it and, and see what, uh, what really strikes me. And the first piece on, it, on the recording was Greenberg. John accompanied this with uh, the CD with a note explaining a little bit of information about some of the pieces. And, and there was some information about this particular piece, but I didn't read the note before I started listening to the CD. I thank I thank to you. Piece, I know. <laughs> as bad as my students. The, uh, um, I began to listen to it, and, and that first piece hit me as being super simple. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, no, I, I'm going to listen further into the CD for something a little more a little more interesting, a little more I can sink my teeth into. This is probably some montage of childhood, some sort of picturesque scene <laughs> of uh, you know, a child's <laughs> Yeah. Then I, I got, I, then I grabbed the note as I got deeper into the CD, and, and he, John mentioned this is a very famous piece, and there might be a little more to it than I thought. So I got onto YouTube and discovered that I was quite wrong about what was going on. We'll talk about that, about the, the, the role the music plays. Uh, but first, let me mention that simplicity that I talked about. We start off with what's, uh, what, what we kind of music geeks like to call a homophonic texture, meaning that there is one primary melody and a fairly simple chordal accompaniment. The fact that that chordal accompaniment is being provided by vocalists doesn't make the texture any different. You have a primary tune that you're going to walk away whistling or humming, and everything else is background to that tune. In addition, uh, we've got... And John, my eyes aren't so good. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Um, the harmony is very simple. We're basically talking about tonic-dominant relationships. So if you have studied music at all, you've probably played your scales, right? Or maybe you didn't study music, but somebody hollered at you at a piano lesson today, hey, you gotta practice those scales. So scales are seven distinct pitches, uh, major and minor scales, that is. And we name, we, we, again, we music uh, folks name each of those pitches. Tonic is the first note of the scale. And the dominant is the fifth note. Those are the two, uh, the two notes in the scale with the, with the strongest relationship. Um, there are so there we go. Just two chords. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. If you were thinking of uh, sound of music, uh, do a deer, female deer. You got do. That's tonic, and uh, so is what brings it back to do. The uh, um, again, with the exception of the refrain, that's pretty much the only chords uh, being used are those two primary chords. So a very simple harmony. The uh, um, I'm trying to remember what I wrote form. down here. The form, really simple binary structure. Uh, basically, two musical ideas, a little bit of repetition. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the, the uh, strophic text setting. If you've been to church, the, uh, <laughs> where, uh, where you sing uh, a series of different um, verses of text, different words, to the same melody. That's what strophic means. Uh, so we have some really simple musical structures here. And that atmosphere of simplicity or innocence or naivete is heightened by the vocal tone employed by the singer. It is not a rich, operatic, classically influenced tone, nor is it the kind of bright, brilliant, piercing, uh, uh, even edgy tone of the pop singer. Uh, and I know that there, there are a range of tone qualities in pop, but generally speaking, pop music doesn't favor rich, sonorous tone. It favors very direct, very focused, very bright tone. 
Neither of those tones are present. This is, again, kind of a young, childlike tone, a slightly breathy tone. And all this creates this, uh, this childlike quality that I mistook as just being a simple tune that was meant to accompany some childlike imagery, some, some images of childhood, rather. Um, what we find, in fact, uh, the neophyte as I am, what I find as I watch some of the, the footage from the show is that this very simple, very, very pretty tune is accompanying scenes of pretty significant violence. Uh, and, uh, and not only is a guy falling out of a, an upper story window, breaking through cathedral glass and shards of sharp glass falling with him, but we're seeing flashbacks of gun battles and other, uh, other mayhem. So what we have here is an example of what is sometimes referred to in film music as running counter to the action, where you are hearing music that expressively is quite different than what you're seeing on the screen. Now, I'm wearing a Star Wars tie. <laughs> so, all I, I, my, my only contribution to the, the wonderful costumes of your way. The, um, if you think back in, the, uh, in episode four to the trash compactor scene, right? And, uh, you know, a moment of high drama, uh, lives are on the line, uh, we're all about to get a lot thinner, and uh, yeah. the soundtrack is reflective of that mood. It's, the, it's driving, it's building, it's scary. The, the, the music is very much in keeping with what's being depicted. In other films, you have music that is quite the opposite of what you're seeing. And I think maybe one of the best, uh, this may not be your era, but one of the best examples of that is the movie Platoon. Are you familiar with, uh, with Platoon? So there is a scene where, where uh, a, a kind of a good guy uh, is, uh, has been abandoned, has been shot by a bad guy, a member of his own squad. And uh, has, the rest of his people have been told he's dead, but as they're flying away, they see him running for his life, being chased by enemy soldiers, being shot in the back. It's a horrific scene of betrayal and death uh, and loss. And in the background is playing a Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings, a hauntingly beautiful and slow-paced uh, piece for string orchestra. So what you're hearing, this sort of this, this beautiful melody and harmony, is in contrast, striking contrast, to the, the scene of graphic violence and loss that you're, that you're seeing on the screen. And we have a very similar example of that here. So I'm assuming you all know this song quite well based on the reaction I got to my initial reaction to the song. We're going to play that for you now. And uh, John has a little pop quiz for all of you about this. See if you can figure out what language this is in. If you know the answer, don't say it. That'll be next. <laughs> Does anyone know what language this is? She made it up. 
Yeah, this is an artificial language. Uh, Yuki Kajiura does the same thing with some of her tunes there. Although, I have to say, I've studied four languages. I'm not sure where the rhetorical logic behind her text is. <laughs> kind of looking for repetition and whatnot, but it's, it, it's very interesting. So if, you, if you're wondering, what? That's not Japanese, it's not Latin, it's not English or Italian. It's a language she made of it. You know, just one thing to mention about that. I don't know if this was, it was uh, her thinking in, in creating a language for this, but many avant-garde uh, choral composers in the 20th century uh, did something very similar. They would use nonsense syllables or meaningless text because they didn't want the listener to be heavily influenced by, by the meaning of a particular word. They simply wanted an expressive mood or a color to predominate. Uh, and so she may well have been thinking of that same thing. She simply wanted that, that kind of childlike quality to wash over you as the listener rather than you be thinking about a particular image put in your mind by a set of text. So. There you have it. Okay, the next piece we're going to take a look at, I uh, analyzed here. This is from Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex. This is Be Human. And for, you know, I've always, you know, my anime composers, probably like everybody, you first fall in love with, you know, Joe Hisaishi, who did, you know, the Ghibli films. And then for me, it was like Susumu Hirasawa, who worked uh, a lot with um, uh, Satoshi Kon. And then Yuki Kajiura, and everyone's like, you really got to check out Yoko Kon. I'm like, okay, so I picked up like three albums. Like, you really got to check out Yoko Kon. I'm like, okay, and I picked them up, and they were good. This one I picked up and I was I like, okay, I get it. Because I heard this first tune and I was just in tears at the end. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's beautiful there. Now, a couple things. Do those pieces of music we played, do you, did, it, did it sound like it's written by the same person? Yeah. No. no, and that's, that's her genius there. And this is going to sound different also. So, um, Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, which um, I would highly recommend to all of you, there are some robots called the Tachikoma, and they're these kind of personal tank robot kawaii philosophers. So it's interesting because they're, you know, they're like, they're these tanks who are self-aware, um, and it's interesting because, you know, they have these really cute, and if you've seen the voice actor, she's this really beautiful, petite Japanese gal who has this really cute high voice, but, you know, these things have guns, and, you know, you can get inside that, and, you know, it, you know, it protects you and stuff. Um, but it's interesting because they have undifferentiated personalities, yet they are self-aware of such. So would they pass the Turing test? I don't know. It's very interesting because they're, they're, they know that. They say we all, we're all of one mind. What does that mean? Um, and they have the desires for, quote, ghosts in their shells. You know, in other words, the, you know, the soul within the, within the, the body there. Um, now, uh, in contrast to the um, last two pieces we've heard, we have a very simple 3-4 meter. You may associate it with the waltz. You're going to hear this one two, three, one, two, three. And much like the last piece, it's, it's, very, um, it's very innocent, uh, very philosophical, uh, a very sparse instrumentation. The last piece only had, no, the big band piece had like, I don't know, probably 20 instruments or, I don't know, how many, about that? Oh, 16, okay, cool. But, um, all right, so the sparse instrumentation, here you're gonna hear a block, that's not what you whip out when you run into trouble in a dangerous part of the city. Uh, this is a blockenspiel, and it sounds like a chime. Uh, you'll hear an electric bass, a very quiet bass, very quiet synthesizer. And for those older otaku out there from the early 90s, you remember something called a modem sound, uh, <laughs> hooking into like AOL or CompuServe or Prodigy or those, any of those old suckers there. Um, voices um, uh, is Scott Matthew, and our lyrics is, of course, our um, English lyricist there, Tim Jensen. So we're going to go ahead and um, tackle this. And there, now this has two different, uh, there are two different voices here. One, you'll hear, um, You'll hear the voice that's processed. You'll hear this, you know, I analyze and I quantify and I, and it's, it's really processed. And then when it comes to the chorus, like if I could be human, that, that, that process, that filter is taken off and you hear all the, you know, the magnificence of uh, Scott Matthews voice there. So you actually have kind of, it's almost this dialogue within itself, which again, reflects back on the anime where the Tachikoma do have dialogues with, with themselves. It really is quite, uh, quite fascinating. Um, anime, because I hate to say it, I love the movie so much, I'm like, how good is this TV show? It's excellent. Okay, don't be like me. See the TV show now and see, you know, both seasons. Um, Solid State Society is good, but definitely the, 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 the two seasons are nice. Uh, sorry, keep jumping in. Specialize in our class 
simplicity of everyday life you know if we could be human with all the stuff we go through and yet it's just so beautiful and so poetic all right uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lopez and we're going to go back to Cowboy Bebop for a bit here great so um, this tune um, that we're going to talk about next is called NY Rush and um, I think it's neat because when I listen to it I, I think that Yoko Kano had something in mind when she wrote it um, and she was kind of uh, emulating, emulating the style of a particular composer. Now, here's a little brief jazz lesson. After um, the swing era in the 30s, jazz went in different directions. And in general, the music got faster, uh, the harmonies got more complex, and it kind of became a music that was designed to kind of show off the skills of the, of the improvisers that were, that were playing it. And in the 40s, we have this, um, this bebop um, movement where, like I said, the, the music got faster and the harmonies got more complex. Well, um, this type of music then later went into a whole bunch of other sub, uh, sub-styles and sub-genres. And um, one of those was kind of a more bluesy, funky, um, kind of hard bop style that we uh, associate with Horace Silver. Now this style, um, if, if I were to summarize it, is basically a style of music that starts with a melody, okay, followed by improvisation. And once the improvisation of the uh, musicians is over, then they go back to the melody, and then the song is over. Um, and so that's what you're going to um, hear in this tune. You have this funky, bluesy style. Um, sounds very much straight, very much straight out of the hard bop style. And then the form, the overall form of the tune is uh, melody, or as we say, the business, the head, followed by the solos, and then the head, and it's done. So we're going to hear this kind of modern harmony, but it's very cool. It's very, uh, like I said, very bluesy, and I want to see what you think about it. Thank you. 
You'll notice there that um, uh, towards the bottom of that slide it says that the sax and trumpet enter with pads. Um, what that means is um, when someone, when you're doing a tune like this, the improvisers are actually improvising over the chords uh, that the melody is based upon. And so one of the options that you have is uh, some of the other players can uh, come in with uh, and outline um, those chords, uh, kind of like providing background, so to speak. So that's what you heard and that's what that is. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. And we're going to stick with Cowboy Bebop. The next piece I'm going to take a look at. And when I gave the four CD set to David, I said I, I listened to it. And I said, "You do what you want." And I listened to the whole thing. I said, "But you may not do this tune." So we're going to take a listen to Space Line from Cowboy Bebop. This is from the Jupiter Jazz, the two episode, um, the two episode. Uh, oh yeah, the two episode of uh, the two episodes at uh, in Cowboy Bebop, which is an amazing, uh, a very good episode. Um, so her influences here are actually, this is interesting. Um, I found this, Robbie Robertson, there is a band called, my friends, The Band. There is a band called The Who. There is a band called Guess Who. There is a band called, yes, there is a band called, you know, The Who. So, you know, you may say, what's he, who, what's he from? The Band. It's, they were actually associated with Bob Dylan um, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s there. But I'll just play a little bit of that as we kind of like, kind of underneath here. This is Coyote Dance. He actually did it, had done it for a, um, uh, a show on Native Americans. Robbie Robertson is uh, part Native American himself there. I, I was, I'm not gonna play both, I won't play all this all the way through because we, we just don't have the time there. But her instrumentation here, um, we're gonna hear synthesizer, uh, percussion, and specifically a drum called a djembe. I brought my djembe with me, but I did park very close, and my djembe is huge, and I just didn't, I just didn't have enough time to run back to my van and haul it over here. Um, but if you get a chance, you know, play a djembe sometime with someone. Um, also, tenor saxophone. Now you may ask, now why is she using tenor saxophone? I'm not gonna tell you. There's a dramatic reason, if you've seen uh, Jupiter Jazz, there is a dramatic reason why she uses um, why she uses the tenor saxophone. It ties into the story, but I don't want to tell you why. Um, let's see, and then you'll hear some uh, voices there. Um, other uh, influences there, uh, cool jazz, especially with the chords, and that's the biggest difference between this version and the version you're gonna hear by Kano there. 
Also, the West African drumming, um, which uh, again, like I said, is on djembe, that's what really turned me on because even my degree is in, my bachelor's degree is in piano, but I do, most of my gigs now, I do on Western African and Latin percussion. Oddly enough, I get way more work on djembe and congas than I do on piano. So that's, I know, that's how it is, gang. <laughs> we can talk to these two. You take any kind of work you can get when you're a musician, even a music teacher. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear some West African drumming as well as a, kind of a West African children's choir. Um, I'm gonna kind of pop around a little bit in this piece. We don't have a whole lot of time, but uh, this is a tenor saxophone, bigger than the regular saxophone. Does anyone recognize this gentleman? John Coltrane, very good job, all right. And if you don't recognize him, Come take Dr. Lopez's history of jazz class with us. Um, and that's a couple of a gentleman in the park, they're playing a djembe. So here we go. Like I said, I'm gonna pop around a little bit. So this is Space Lion from Cowboy Bebop. Day at work, come home, <laughs> glass of wine, turn the lights down, listen to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit here, my friends. Dr. Lopez here, we're going to take a look at another one. Uh, yeah, well, uh, one of the things that I think is so cool about Yoko Kano's music is that it's, you kind of never know what you're going to get. Um, she, uh, and so when I heard this tune, I, I was pleasantly surprised because I thought to myself, wow, this sounds really like this one particular band that I, um, um, that I like a lot called the Yellow Jackets. And the Yellow Jackets are a, um, uh, a jazz ensemble, jazz group, yeah, that, uh, uh, that got uh, started in the late 70s and then and, and would continue to work through the 80s. They start started as a trio and then later they would add saxophone. Um, but the Yellow Jackets would uh, are, are still playing and they're an, a really great group that makes use of um, jazz and rock elements. So you with the Yellow Jackets tunes you typically have kind of more modern complex harmonies but you also have kind of a simpler texture and it's not so overwhelming like a large ensemble like a big band. So you have uh, a smaller group great jazz and it makes um, kind of use and, and uh, it displays the, the virtuosity of their players. So in this case, I think to me, this sounds really um, like a heavily influenced um, Yellow Jackets tune. 
However, I must admit that it also sounds very similar to um, perhaps Vince Guaraldi. So I'll let you decide. I'll let you say if you think it sounds more like Charlie Brown or the Yellow Jacket. <laughs> pieces we like to play the whole thing I mean granite's bass line is eight minutes long so I realize <laughs> this is a bit much okay I'm gonna turn it over to dr. Jones and uh, he's gonna be now did you have you seen any of this anime because I have not no, no. Uh, Genesis of Aquarian do we need to see that yes or no yes, yes and Aquarian evolve I'll watch them all okay well we're gonna watch them all then. okay not today but okay so this is Pandora Pandora from Aquarian evolve and go ahead. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, that John had given me a list of pieces to select from, and I tried to choose two pieces that, uh, that provided a contrast, not really realizing how much contrast you'd hear just in the entire lineup. We're, we're going to go from the Charlie Brown Christmas special to an acapella choral piece, and it sounds like it, it could be a, a, a sacred piece of music at a, at a cathedral. The, um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I spent a bit of time talking about the simplicity of Greenbird. Um, this, I think, provides a contrast with that 
vocal simplicity from the standpoint of um, melodic contrast. In Greenbird, we heard a very clear tune. You could walk out of this room humming that melody. That's not so much the case here. There's a fairly simple motivic structure, um, but it's not assembled in such a way that you would call it a melody that you could easily hum. A three-note motive where, you, where the singer leaps up the octave and then back down to the fifth um, is repeated several times, but in the context of total rhythmic freedom. Unlike Greenbird, again, or any of the, the recent pieces we just listened to, there is no steady pulse. So no beat that you can tap your, your foot to. Um, this has a much more free-flowing, slightly more chant-like uh, feel to it. And then it gives way to, uh, to a, a, a kind of tonally based, but, uh, but fairly dissonant uh, use of tone cluster. Now, again, a quick music lesson. I mentioned the word tonality. Um, we're very accustomed to major and minor scales that I mentioned before, the doe a deer, female deer kind of scales. Um, and it, as, we, as composers headed into the 20th century, they tried to get away from that. In fact, they took very definite steps to avoid any reference to major or minor scales. Um, the, uh, anytime there's a movement in music, there's going to be a reaction to it. And one of the reactions to that movement away from tonality was to still make use of, of pieces that to write pieces that had an, an underlying uh, uh, major or minor tonality, but to incorporate a lot of free dissonance within. And so one of the ways composers would do this is by grouping clusters of notes together. So you're going to hear that here in, uh, in, this, uh, in this piece. Explain what, a, explain what a cluster is, though. An in fact, you sing, a, you sing a note, and I'll go a half step above. Go. Oh, okay. uh, uh, <laughs> Those are, that's a tone cluster. They're very, they're what we call it, they're dissonant. But that would be an example of a tone cluster that gave you no sense of any underlying key. There are ways to use tone clusters that still preserve the tonal foundation. And that's what we'll hear here as well. And if you want a really easy way to think of a tone cluster, imagine a piano or a synthesizer keyboard. Do you have those keys in your mind in front of you? Now take your hand, palm down, and mash down a bunch of keys, right? That's a tone cluster. Um, and if you work those sorts of groupings of pitches together in such a way that they're still preserving the basic major minor scale uh, uh, structure beneath them, then you still have that sense of tonality, even though there's a, a fairly free use of dissonance. It's in that sense that I felt like she's, uh, she's drawing on um, a similar approach that you hear a lot of 20th century composers, such as Poulenc. Poulenc? Yeah. Okay, we were debating this. Feel like the uh, the uh, uh, or Eric Whitaker. By the way, are there any choral singers in the room? Anybody singing choir? A few. Okay. So if you have sung in a choir, you've probably come across Eric Whitaker. He makes extensive use of tone clusters, but in a very tonal setting. Um, and uh, and actually, with no further ado, let's go ahead and listen to that piece. If you saw the Godzilla film last year, the you know when they're popping out of the. Um, when they're hopping out of the planes to go like attack, and those, those you hear tone clusters there a lot because one of my friends actually sang on the soundtrack at Irvine Valley College, and he showed me the score. And that's and if you can think of that scene with those, those dissonant harmonies there, that's Exhibit A there. And that, by the way, is from a piece by uh, Georgi Ligeti, a well-known 20th century composer who uh, focuses on atonal uses of tone clusters, uh, whereas we'll hear here a little more tonally based. Oh.
And again, amazing, amazing uh, eclecticism in her music, the fact that she does all this stuff well, I think is quite amazing. Yeah. And um, actually, Dr. Um, Jones actually has some pieces up there. So if any of you want to, uh, we've been seeing people snap photos. You can snap photos of us. You probably want to snap it on the screen, though. Um, but yeah, feel free to do that. Some other works by Francis Poulain and the Luce Eterna. I don't know that by Fischinger. 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 Oh, also, the text, I could not, I looked up, I tried to find the text for this online. I can't find it. So I think it just may be vocal. Those nonsense syllables are technically called vocables. So if you're like la 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 lu 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 or, you know, like a Native American chant or whatnot. Um, those are technically called vocables there. All right, the next piece we're gonna look at, um, I, wanna take, I wanna take a look at Run Rabbit Jump from uh, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex because uh, on the, this is kind of the flip side of be human. This is like all the insanity of the, uh, <laughs> of the Ghost in the Shell world there. Um, influences here, as you probably know, uh, electronica, you're gonna hear a heavily, a heavily processed voice with a lot of filters on it there. Um, rock slash funk slash the Beastie Boys. <laughs> kind of like, no, I'm sorry, kind of like yelling out, and I'm like, you know, this whole kind of, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, white guy rap yelling out there, not trying to, you know, not trying to imitate, um, you know, uh, some of the other masters there. Also, and I can't find this, and if anybody can recognize this, I would swear there's a guitar line that happens during the course that I swear is from some 70s TV show like a police cop theme or whatever. <laughs> it's not the Rockford Files, it's not Adam 12, but I'm thinking somewhere in the back of my skull, I've heard this before. And I've, I've if you know, you're too young. <laughs> but if you know, uh, <laughs> uh, alright, so I, it's, it's somewhere. Um, so, like I said, the song reflects the energy and chaos of the cyberpunk world of Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. Uh, lyrics by Tim Jensen and vocals by Hyde or uh, Hideyuki Takahashi. And there he is there, yeah, so some of you know him. So here we go, this is Run Rabbit Junk, and um, there are, I mean, a lot of it is nonsense, and this, a lot of this, of course, does come out of the cyberpunk movement of the 90s, where, you know, we're gonna jack in, and kind of this whole new way of talking, and we're gonna spend time in the virtual world, which didn't really pan out, but, um, <laughs> but, no, but still, very fascinating, and if you've not seen it, again, we highly recommend, well, I highly recommend Standalone <laughs> Complex. So here we go.
FEV, that's a tough one. Anyone know this one? I had to look it up. Fuel air explosive. Ooh, well, no. Uh, it's FEB. It's actually a Far East Bank, from what I could tell. Far Eastern Bank. CNN? Okay, and BBC? Your kids have watched Doctor Who. Very good. All right. Okay, so we'll see a space cowboy. So just to sum up, sum up, an eclectic composer whose talent is not limited to any specific musical genre. We've got you know three pop, three types of jazz, you know electronica, experimental stuff with me. You've got the classicals, 